Today we're going to learn a chord study for minor swing, the Gypsy Jazz classic written by Django Reinhardt. This is a real lesson on how to dress up and embellish what is essentially a simple three chord progression. Very much like in the blues, our cornerstones here are going to be the one, the four and the five. But with the help of some inversions, chord runs and substitutions, it's going to sound like much more. Now to start, let's map out the most basic changes. So we're in the key of A minor and we're starting on the one. But rather than playing a plain A minor, we're going to play an A minor six, which is typical of the gypsy jazz style. And just while we're mapping the basic changes out, let's use three note voicings. The four chord is our D minor six, so we're gonna drag this same shape all the way up to the 10th fret. Then the five chord is E seven, so we're gonna use the same shape again at the seventh fret. And now we can think of it as E seven with the fifth in the bass. If you've not seen my thorough deep dive into three note voicings, do check that out. I'll link to it in the description. And that's all we need to outline the most basic form of the changes here, hitting all those important moments, the one, the four, and the five. Here we go. A one, two, three, four. And that would be one chorus, one entire play through the 16 bar form. I would certainly recommend checking out the links in the description so you can get hold of the lesson materials for this. They'll include the basic changes and then our embellished chord study. Now my performance at the beginning was four choruses, so four times around the 16 bar structure, each time getting a little more progressively advanced. Now for our first 16 bar playthrough, which we're going to refer to as exercise one, we basically are just going to outline those basic changes. Uh, just with a couple of small additions, one of them being when we go to the E7, instead of doing two bars on that, we're going to do a, a bar of E7 and then a bar of its tritone substitution, the B flat 7, and then resolving back to your A minor 6, and then we need a turnaround. We're going to play F7 to E7. Again, both of those have the fifth in the bass, so F7 over C, technically we could call it and E7 over B. So here's exercise one. So, on to exercise number two. The first thing we're going to do is just extend the range of this three note voicing by barring the third finger across the top three strings. Doesn't change anything about the name of the chord, it's still A minor six. All we've done is we've put the fifth in and the root on top. It's just thickened the sound a little. So we do two bars there. Now for the D minor six, we're going to go down to this voicing which may look like a B minor seven flat five, and it is, but it's also D minor six with the sixth in the bass. So you can see here, there's a clear D minor triad, and then that B note in the bass is the sixth degree. So there's your D minor six, again, a very authentic gypsy voicing for that kind of chord. And then for our E7, we're gonna play this. Again, a very standard voicing in the world of jazz. It's just like a C7 open chord dragged all the way up to the fifth fret. Now instead of doing two bars there, we're gonna do one bar, and then we're gonna play a D diminished seventh, which if you've seen my recent video on diminished chords, you'll understand that this is functioning as the E7 still, but with a flattened nine. If we look at these intervals through the lens of E being the root, you have the flat seven, the third, the fifth, and the flat nine. So we can go E7 to E7 flat 9, courtesy of this D diminished chord voicing. Then resolve back to your A minor 6. And then instead of doing another bar there, we're thinking ahead to the bar after that, which would be the D minor, and we're going to insert the 5 of D minor along the way to kind of set that chord up on a pedestal and resolve to it. So the 5 of D minor would be A7, 
So we're going to turn this A minor 6 into an A7. And then that will resolve beautifully to the D minor 6. So check out the sound there. You've got A minor 6, A7 to the D minor 6, as opposed to two bars of A minor 6 to the D minor 6. You can really hear the A7 pulls us towards the D minor chord. So in this context, we refer to this A7 as a secondary dominant, this being the 5 of 4, because D minor is 4. OK, so this time for the D minor 6, we're using this voicing, which is very much like our three-note voicing from earlier on the low E string, but moved to the next string set, and then with the uh, fifth fret of the top string added in there, D minor 6. Another very common voicing. And then we're heading back to A minor, but instead of A minor 6, this time we're going to go A minor 6 9. Great voicing, I've spoken about it in some previous lessons. Can be a little bit of a tricky one. Uh, it's one where the thumb has to hook over and play the root at the fifth fret of the low E string this time. Second finger has to do one of these barring techniques we've spoken about in previous videos, where you're barring two strings with the tip of the finger, the seventh fret of the A and the seventh fret of the D. Like I always say, you've got to aim for the wood in between the two strings, and it does take practice. It won't happen for a while. You'll get some buzzing and some muted sounding notes, but it will be worth it in the long run if you can persevere with it. Then on the G string, first finger playing the fifth fret, and then the third finger barring the seventh fret on the top two strings. Adding the thumb over. In fact, I'd recommend building it that way to begin with. Get this main portion of it down as a priority and add the thumb over when you feel comfortable. So we're going to do two bars there. And then E7, and again, just like before, instead of two bars on E7, we're going to do the tritone substitution halfway through to the B-flat 7, where I'm now bringing in not only the three-note voicing, but the B-string too resolving back to your A minor 6 down here, and then the turnaround, F9 rooted on the A string, E9 rooted on the A string. So here's exercise 2 played at a slower tempo. 1, 2, 3, 4. As always, please do check out the links in the description. You can get hold of all of these lesson materials at my Patreon, where for a very small monthly cost you get access to all of my materials, plus a ton of bonus stuff and some exciting interviews coming up on there soon as well with some great players. If Patreon isn't your thing, you can make a one-off purchase at my Gumroad store for these lesson materials. Very affordable, and it means you can keep hold of them for life and study them as and when you choose, of course. It's your support that allows me to keep making these videos, so I really do genuinely appreciate it. OK, we progress. Exercise number three. So we're starting with this A minor 6 again for two bars. And then we're going to go for yet another way of playing the D minor 6 chord. Uh, we're going to go for this hefty little fella down here. Very muscular sounding. I love these deep, dark voicings like this. So if we're thinking D minor, there's your fifth. There's your root, flat three, six. Now for the E7, we're going to use that diminished approach we spoke about earlier. Again, do check out my thorough deep dive into how to do this stuff. So earlier on, we said a D diminished seventh could be used as an E7 flat nine type of voicing. Now if we take that through to its logical conclusion, you know, the diminished repeats every three frets. One of those is G sharp diminished. So let's find that on the low E string with this three note voicing. Fourth fret, skip the A string. Third fret, fourth fret. Notice how again, if we move this in minor thirds as well, we get back to the E7 
that we used in the most basic version of this. E7 with the fifth in the bass. And that's what we're going to do. Four beats on each. So I would personally just think of all of that as E7. But if you want to be really specific, you can think G sharp diminished seventh, functioning as E7 flat nine. B diminished seventh, functioning as E7 over B. Or again, the E7 flat nine is kind of inferred at that point. Now we're going to take the simplest route back to our A minor six and move this down two frets, back to that three note voicing we had earlier on, A minor six. So we've used one shape there to get from five to one. Pretty nifty, right? So we've gone E7, E7 again, A minor six. Now on this A minor six, we're going to put in a very common chord run. We're going to do this. Leads us all the way up to our four chord, the D minor six. So that would be A minor six, E7 over B again, an A minor triad, spread triad, and then C sharp diminished seventh, functioning as A7 flat nine, resolving to D minor six. So in that context, the A7 is the five of the D, as we said earlier. So again, it's the same thing we did in the previous exercise. A7 is the five of D minor. So we can think about it as five of four. It's a great way to climb the fretboard and get to your four chord. Now we're on the four, we're just gonna stay there for two bars, D minor six. Bringing in the full range again by borrowing that third finger. Now we're going back to A minor again for two bars, where we're going to put in some extra movement courtesy of the good old line cliche. Again, I've spoken about this kind of thing in previous videos. Uh, a good example would be the In a Sentimental Mood video where we feature the line cliche a couple of times. In a nutshell, it's a case of simply grabbing an A minor chord, finding the root somewhere in the middle of the shape, and moving that note down in semitones till you reach the sixth. Thus creating all of these little variations of A minor along the way. A minor, A minor major seven, A minor seven back to A minor six, two beats on each. Now we're at that part with the E7 again where we're gonna do the tritone substitution to the B flat, but let's swap them over and do the B flat first, followed by the E7. It's a nice little tweak that just keeps things sounding fresh. And that's the way around that Django does it in Deuce Ambiance. Again, one I've done a video on previously. Now for our turnaround this time, we're gonna go A minor six to F7 over C, E7 over B, to the E7, where all we're doing is taking that fifth away from the bass and returning it just to the root note on the A string seventh fret. So here's exercise three, played slowly. One, two, three, four. to the fourth and final exercise. This one has the kitchen sink thrown in. Way back in around 2011, I had the pleasure of playing at a Gypsy Jazz Festival, and I had the honor of being shown personally by one of the greats how he would approach playing this tune, and it gave me a lot of stuff to dig into and work on over the years. That player was Martin Limberger, who's a very well-known and highly regarded Gypsy Jazz player, who's played with everybody you can think of, from Stichello Rosenberg to Birelli Legren to Tommy Emmanuel and so many other great players. So I feel blessed that he showed me personally how he would play this stuff. And this following exercise is made up mostly of the things he showed me. Now for our first six bars, we're gonna change chords every two beats. So we're starting on our A minor six, three note voicing again. And then we're gonna move it up two frets to the E7 over B. And then we're gonna do that climb, A minor triad with the uh, C in the bass. 
C sharp diminished, functioning as A7, resolving to D minor 6. And then follow the same kind of principle there. Take this D minor 6 upper whole tone to A7 over E. And then the D minor triad. So the exact same trick we used on A minor, we're now using on D minor. Sorry if you can hear something rattling around here. I don't know what's going on. I think something may have come loose <laughs> inside. So yeah, the same trick twice. A minor, D minor. And we're just including the C sharp diminished as a halfway house in between. Think about what that move actually includes. You've got the one, the five, and then a first inversion of the one. So you're thinking A minor, E7, A minor. Same here, D minor, A7, D minor. Or if we're thinking of D minor as one, one, five, one again. Okay. And then, to get to the E7 three note voicing, we're gonna start a semitone above and play this F7 before landing on it. Just a semitone above, easy way of adding a bit of color to the chord change. Now on this E7, we're gonna take this kind of fidget fingers approach, as I like to think of it. Where we're just moving back and forth, a semitone. E7, E flat seven, E7. And there's that diminished again, D diminished seventh, giving us the sound of E7 with a flat nine. Resolving to A minor six. It's very similar to that A minor 6 9 from earlier, but without the 9 on top, and fingered slightly differently because of where I've come from with this D diminished. If you keep all those fingers on the same strings, you can just slide everything up and reshape it slightly, but the fingers don't have to leave those strings that they're already assigned to from the diminished. And then the thumb hooks over to play the bass. Nice little trick. And then we're going to the A7 again as the 5 of 4. It's going to take us to the D minor. But instead of 4 beats on it, we're going to do 2 beats. And then it's tritone substitution. So the E flat 7, 3 note voicing, but with the 5th in the bass, as well as the root. You can feel free to hook your thumb over to do that if it's easier. It's less movement certainly than going. And then having to bar again with the tip of that finger. Both approaches are good to practice, of course. Now, another thing that Martin showed me was this. He says that he likes to sneak in a bit of autumn leaves in the middle of this progression. I think this has become quite a common thing to do in the gypsy jazz world. Now, let's first of all look at the simple way of playing the autumn leaves progression. D minor 7, G7, C major 7, F major 7, B minor 7 flat 5, E7, Back to the A minor. The voicings that we're going to use, D minor 7, take your three note voicing and add the little finger to the B string 6th fret. As a bit of a random aside, that three note voicing for a D minor 7 is a bit of a Johnny Greenwood favourite as well. It's not just a jazz voicing. These things have no limit really. of you fellow Radiohead fans out there. So we're taking that D minor 7, putting the little finger on the B string, and then after two beats, we're going to alternate the bass to the fifth, and then we're going to go to this really nice, again, common gypsy jazz trick that you'll hear being used a lot. We're thinking G13, but we're putting the flat 9 in the bass. So it's like a G13 over A flat. Or really, you just want to think G13 flat 9, but the flat 9's in the bass. There it is with the flat 9 on top. All we're doing is taking that down to the low E string. So remember, this is functioning as G7. So now we can think, okay, let's try to sub that to the D flat 7. We're going to go for a D flat 9, so a dominant 9th. And then resolve that down to... C6-9 before moving that along a 
fourth to the F69. So that would be. And then we've got the minor 251 in the key of A minor. So B minor 7 flat 5, which I would go for this voicing in this case. Often I would play this without the thumb. But because of what we're about to do, the thumb's going to be useful. And then put the uh, flat 5 in the bass. Which notice as a side note, gives us this, what looks like an F6 chord. It's a useful trick to remember. B minor 7 flat 5 and F6 are kind of interchangeable. That would be the flat 5 in the bass. And then E7. Listen to how smoothly that moves to E7. Beautiful. And then tritone sub of the E7, B flat 7, but we're chucking a 13 on top. And then A minor 6, where we're going to use this very typical uh, rhythmic punctuation that you hear a lot at the endings of these songs. 1 and 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, and. 1 and 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, and. And then for the last chord, just the, the cherry on top, I couldn't resist. I had to add this. One of our melodic minor chords. A minor 6 with the major 7 on top. Thumb hooked over makes it more playable. Another great ending chord that you hear a lot in the gypsy jazz world. Okay, so here's the fourth and final exercise played at a slow tempo. One, two, three, four. So as I'm sure you're aware, this stuff tends to be played at quite a brisk tempo. Uh, for my opening performance, I believe it was around 190 BPM-ish. So aim for around there, try and get it up to about 200-ish, so that you can cope with these changes at fast speeds and make sure everything still sounds very clean. That's the main thing. If it's fast and chaotic, it's no good. It's got to be fast and concise and clean. Every chord must sound well-defined. It takes a lot of practice and a lot of patience. You've got to be willing to sit there and run through this stuff slowly, gradually building speed when you're comfortable and ready. At some point in the future, I'm going to do a lesson breakdown on Django's fantastic minor swing solo, and this rhythm part will come in very handy for that. We'll use it as our backing track. And it would be great if you could put this down in your looper at some point and then play the lead over it. I mean, how cool would that be? So, as far as strumming technique goes, we're using something that's referred to as La Pompe rhythm style. I covered this in a bit of detail in my Deuce Ambiance video, so do check that out. But as a quick summary, and in order of importance, this is what it boils down to. First of all, you've got to maintain solid downstroke quarter notes, and you've got to mute the chord in the left hand after every strum. Now that might seem boring, but you've got to do that with the metronome. strokes. Now as you get confident doing that and you get it sounding really smooth, start accenting beats two and four very slightly. Do not let it become this. Oompa Loompa stuff. It's no good. You've got to make sure you're hitting multiple strings all the time. Beats one and three, you're typically going to be hitting the three note voicing part of a chord, and then beats two and four are where you're going to unleash the other strings and hit all six. which might naturally give you a bit of a volume accent on two and four, which is what we want. Nothing extreme. When that's feeling comfortable, start incorporating a muted upstroke now and then on the and of two and the and of four. So that would be one, 
Again, make sure that upstroke is truly muted. Don't let any horrible buzzing notes come through. It's got to be totally dead. It's a really great sound once you get the knack of it. So of course I'm using my 1953 ES125, all original, including the brilliant P90 pickup. Tone and volume all the way up, running through a Lazy J20 amp, which is like an old Fender Tweed Deluxe kind of circuit. Um, and that's going through the Universal Audio Oxbox, and then I'm blending in the signal of this vocal mic. It's catching a bit of the bleed of the acoustic sound of the guitar, and just adds a bit more of that string energy and you know, the top end of the strings. It's really nice. Plectrum wise, again I'm using that Honeypix 2mm smoker pick. It's nice and thick and doesn't bend at all. Good for this style of music. The strings are Tomasic Infields 12 gauge flat wounds um, and they feel really good on this guitar. Thanks as ever to my Patreon crew. You guys are amazing. We're going to need to come up with a proper name for you. I was thinking Patreon Swingers, but I guess that sounds a little bit dodgy. Let me know in the comments below if you have any better ideas. As always, please do like and subscribe and comment down below. Share this video with people that you think might be interested. All of that engagement really is essential for channels and it's the only thing that stops them from fading into obscurity. And I do not want to fade into obscurity. So thanks for watching guys. Have fun playing Minor Swing, getting it up to fast tempos. And I'll see you next week. Cheers.